everyone. I'm Jill Morricone. We just welcome you to another edition of 3AB and Sabbath School Panel. As we journey through God's mission, my mission. We just finished two weeks on God's mission to us, part one and two. This is lesson number three. We launch in God's call to mission. Before we go any further, I want to introduce your family, my family on the set here to my left, my sister in Christ, Shelly Quinn. <laughs> Amen. I have Monday, so listen, becoming a blessing to the whole world, and I'm looking forward to it. We are too. In the middle, Pastor John Lomacain. Yes, and mine is Abraham's call, very much identified with the way my wife and I and the ministry that God gave to us has uh, unfolded. I'm looking forward to it. Amen. Mm -hmm. To your left, Pastor James Rafferty. Good to be here, Jill. I have Wednesday's lesson, The Early Church and Comfort Zones. Yay. Uh, Last yeah. but not least, Ryan Day, singer and evangelist in Israel. And maybe you're going to sing for us. Are you going to sing for us today? I don't know. Well, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> but I have Thursday's lesson entitled, Starting from Where You Are. Okay. Looking forward to it. And we always love that you spend time with us every single week as we open up the Word of God and study together. Before we go any further, we want to go to the Lord in prayer. Ryan, would you pray for us? Absolutely. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we praise you on this day. We thank you for another opportunity to study your Word, to learn of you, to grow in you, Lord, and to understand your mission for us as your people and as your children. Mm -hmm. And so, Father, we ask that you pour out your spirit upon this panel, mm -hmm. that everything we say and communicate is in accordance with your will and your word, and that every person watching and participating is blessed, and for that we're all drawn to you, mm -hmm. the power of the Holy Spirit, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we look at God's call to mission, to me this week, we see the juxtaposition, that's a hard word for me to say, of God's call to mission in our lives with my complacency, my fear, sometimes even my unwillingness or refusal to evangelize. You see, the first element is God's call to mission. There's a quote that's often attributed to John Wesley, although many people say they don't think he said it, but whoever said it, it's this, do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. Mm -hmm. Acts of the Apostles, page 28, says it this way. The disciples were to work earnestly for souls, giving to all the invitation of mercy. They were not to wait for the people to come to them. They were to go to the people with their message. It's really the call to share the gospel that Jesus gave, the Great Commission. We've referenced it before in Matthew chapter 28. We call it at 3 ABN, go ye. Go ye at all times. Go ye in all places. Go ye whether we feel like it or not. So on the one side, we have God's call to mission, which is extended to everyone. Once you have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you are called to be a missionary. But on this side, the other element in the equation is my complacency, my fear, my sometimes unwillingness to get out of my comfort zone as I become involved in evangelism. There's a quote I like. It says, God uses any means necessary to tear down what we hide behind. Mm -hmm. And we find this week that God wants to save us. And sometimes that's including saving us from ourselves. And he wants to push us out of the nest or push us out of our comfort zone when it comes to evangelism. The memory text, we read this on a previous lesson, is Acts 1 verse 8 but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Sunday's lesson is called Moving Beyond Our Comfort Zone and we're going to Genesis chapter 11. Turn with me there. We're going to take everything from Genesis chapter 11. This is, of course, the Tower of Babel experience. And I'm going to do six lessons that you and I can learn from the Tower of Babel. We're looking at Genesis 11, verses 1 to 9. And then we're going to have two takeaways. Now, you might say, Jill, why are there six lessons and two takeaways? When I get done, you might understand because they're a little different. So six lessons and then two takeaways at the end. So Genesis 11, verse 1. Now the whole earth had one language 
and one speech. Lesson number one, beware when everything is easy. Mm. One language would be a unifier, would it not? Mm -hmm. And it seems easiest if we have one language. But the easy road is not always the best road. Jesus tells us in Matthew 7, 13 and 14, enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. So beware when everything is easy. We're in verse 2, Genesis 11, verse 2. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. Now from the east, many translations, if you look at it in many different passages, it's actually translated toward the east. And you notice in uh, Genesis 4, Cain moved east when he left the presence of the Lord. In Genesis 13, Lot moved east when he separated from Abram. In Genesis 25, we find that Keturah's sons moved east. Lesson two, beware when moving away from God. Mm. It's dangerous to make decisions when we're drifting away from God. They were called, what were they called to do after the flood? To spread out, to be fruitful, to be multiply. This congregating, as it were, was in direct disobedience, direct defiance to God's directive. We're in Genesis 11, verse 3. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. Now it's interesting, they used sun-dried bricks. They used them in the east for building purposes. And then they burned the bricks thoroughly, which made them more durable. Now it says they had asphalt for mortar. It's interesting, asphalt was a bitumen, is that how you pronounce that? Or a kind of pitch. It boils up from subterranean fountains like oil or hot pitch in the vicinity of Babylon and also near the Dead Sea. This substance you can still see in the ruins of Babylon today. Brick walls covered with pitch or this bitumen. Lesson number three, beware in trusting that you can do what you can do will somehow save you. This is, we really see in the Tower of Babel, we begin to see salvation by works. Mm -hmm. If they only worked harder, if they only congregated together, if they only built higher or better, they could somehow prevent catastrophe. Their desire to reach heaven showed they probably wanted to be safe from another flood. But beware in trusting that what you can do will somehow save you. If I only make it more bricks, if I only burn them properly, if I only cover them with the asphalt like I'm supposed to, maybe I can save myself. We're down to Genesis 11, verse 4. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Lesson number four, beware of pride and self-sufficiency. What was the purpose of the building? To make a name for ourselves. Making a name is always the work of God, not ourselves. We don't create a name. It's the work of God. You see in God's call to Abram, Shelley, in Genesis 12, 2, he says, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. It wasn't Abraham's job to make himself a name. That was God's job. Mm -hmm. We see Lucifer in heaven in Isaiah 14, he wanted a name for himself. He wanted to ascend to heaven. He wanted to exalt his throne above the stars of God. He wanted to sit on the mound of the congregation in the sides of the north. He wanted to be like the most high. Beware of pride and self-sufficiency. Now we're in verse 5, Genesis 11:5. 5. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the sons of men had built. To me, this is the key of the entire text. The Lord came down. Now, it's kind of funny. Did God not know what was happening? Did he have oh. to come down? Psalm 139, 7 and 8 says, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. Clearly, God knows everything. That's so right. that's not what he's saying. 
it's almost, you could see, a bit of satire. The towers reaching to the clouds, yet God has to come down a great way even to see it. Like God has to stoop from heaven, right? All the way down to see it. Really what's happening here when God comes down to see is a judgment taking place. Mm -hmm. This is an investigation. This is a legal verdict. God investigated the case. Mm -hmm. He's looking at what's happening before he pronounces judgment. He always does that. Lesson number five, beware if you are on the wrong side of the verdict. Mm -hmm. Ooh. Yeah. I'm so glad in Daniel 7, when the investigative judgment takes place, verse 22, the, when the Ancient of Days comes, judgment is made in favor of the saints of the Most High. Beware if you're on the wrong side of the verdict, but the saints don't have to be afraid because right. judgment is made in favor of the saints. Mm -hmm. We're going down to verse 6, and the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they have one language, and this is what they begin to do. Now, nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Lesson 6, beware Beware of a coalition of evil. When there is a united bent toward evil, the people had come together as one. It is most destructive. Now we come down to our two takeaways in our final moments. We're in Genesis 11, 7 and 8. Come, God is speaking. Let us, you notice the plural, God the Father, Son and Holy Spirit, go down and confuse the language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the earth and they ceased building the city. Takeaway number one, no matter what happens, God is sovereign. You know, it's amazing to me that the people thought they could outwit God. They could mm. circumvent God's plan. Oh, if we are united, if we get ourselves together, we can really out. No, God is sovereign. God is in control of the entire world. And even when it looks like evil's about ready to win, even when it looks like everything is going the wrong way, God can overrule and overturn mm -hmm. events because God is sovereign. The last verse, Genesis is 11, 9. Therefore, its name is called Babel, mm. because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there, the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. Mm. Takeaway two, God accomplishes what he begins. <laughs> Their tower building was effectively shut down. They were disseminated throughout the earth. Right. God accomplished his purpose. In in spite of their rebellion, in spite of what they were doing, God still accomplished his purpose. So we are to beware when everything is easy. Beware when moving away from God and trusting that what you can do or your own works is going to save you. Beware of pride and self-sufficiency, mm. of being on the wrong side of the judgment. Beware of a coalition of evil and know that no matter what happens, God is sovereign and what he begins, he always accomplishes. Amen. Thank you. That was good. I like those two takeaways. I'm Shelley Quinn and I have Monday's lesson, Becoming a Blessing to the Whole World. When Abraham lived in the Ur of Chaldees, God called him out of that there and he left with his father Terah, his wife Sarah, and his nephew Lot. And they made it halfway to Canaan, but they stopped in Haran. And then this is what happened some years later. We don't know how long they were there, but when Abraham was 75, God says this to him in Genesis 12, one through three. The Lord had said to Abram, who he changed his covenant name to Abraham later, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and I will make your name great. As you said, Jill, it's God who's going to make his name great. You shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in you, mm -hmm. all the families of the earth will be blessed. Mm -hmm. This is why Paul says, Romans 4, 11, Abraham is the father of us all, not just his biological descendants, but he has spiritual descendants who are of the faith of Abraham. Mm -hmm. So in Hebrews 11:8. The faith chapter, it says this, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called 
out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. Child. I love the heart of Abraham. When God, the Lord of glory, called Abraham, he was just like Noah. Mm. He didn't ask questions. He responded. The study guide says this. It was all part of God's plan to use Abraham as a vehicle to fulfill his divine purposes on the earth. And Abraham went according to the word of the Lord. So it says, if God has a plan for you, it may be a call for you to leave your extended family and your people and go to a place that he is opening up for you to serve him in order that you can be a blessing to others. Mm. So let's look at a couple of texts that talk about God's covenant and his promises to us. I love Genesis 3.15. This is the first prophetic announcement of the everlasting covenant of righteousness by faith. It was a message of hope to fallen humanity. And in Genesis 3.15, God is speaking to Satan who has taken on, uh, he's using a serpent as a median. And the Lord said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise your head and you will bruise his heel. Do you realize in less than 30 words, less than 30 words, God outlines mm -hmm. the entire cosmic conflict mm -hmm. and how it's going to come to an end. Mm -hmm. He is going to send a seed who will be the solution to the sin problem. The seed of a, will be born of a woman, a virgin birth, and that seed was going to crush Satan's head mm. under his feet. Galatians 3.16, Paul says, To Abraham and his seed were the promises made. Mm -hmm. He does not say, and to seeds as of many, mm. but as of one, and to your seed, mm -hmm. who is Christ. So now, Abraham some years passed, we don't know how long. He was 75 when God called him out of Haran. Now Abraham is 99 years old and the Lord appears to him again. And here's something that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Ishmael had been his only son mm -hmm. for 13 years. You remember Sarah got impatient waiting, sent, her, uh, sent uh, Abraham to her maidservant, mm -hmm. Hagar, and they birthed Ishmael. Ishmael had been Abraham's only son for 13 years. And God comes before him. And you know, if you read Genesis, or, uh, Genesis 17, he is actually asking God that Ishmael could stand before him. He was looking mm -hmm. at Ishmael as the covenant son. And here's what God said in verse Genesis 17, 19. Nope, mm -hmm. no. That's not my plan, Abraham. He said, Sarah, your wife shall bear you a son and you shall name his name Isaac. Mm. And I have to say this, most people think that Isaac was given as the name of laughter because that it Sarah. was Sarah laughed. Mm -hmm. Abraham laughed first. She doesn't laugh till the next chapter in mm -hmm. Genesis 18. <laughs> God gave the name Isaac because Abraham laughed. So he says here, uh, I will establish my covenant with him for, for an everlasting covenant and with his descendants after him. So Christ the Messiah was going to come through the descendants of Abraham, through Sarah and Abraham. And we see in Hebrews 11, 9 that Isaac and Jacob, who were his son and his grandson, were heirs to the promises mm -hmm. that God made to Abraham. And then this son came. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7. I love this prophecy. For unto us a child is yes. born, unto us a son is given, 
and the government shall be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father and Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. The most exciting thing to me about prophecy is the prophecy that was given to Daniel because God actually announced the date of the arrival of the Messiah. In Daniel 8, he's told this 2300 day prophecy. In Daniel 9, he says 70 weeks, 490 years of that 2300 are cut off for your people. And then he says, that's for the Israelites. Then he says that in Daniel 9 and 27, that the Messiah is coming. He's gonna confirm a covenant for one week in the middle of the week three and a half years into that week, he will bring an end to the offering and sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Do you realize the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ, the lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world, was three and a half years into Jesus' ministry, the cross. He started his ministry in AD 27 at the age of 30. Now people go, what do you mean at the age of 30? If it's AD 27, wasn't he born in AD 1? No, he was not. When the computation for the Christian error, E-R-A, was made, an error, E-R-R-O-R, was of about four years was made. In other words, AD 1 should have been AD 5. Jesus began his public ministry at the age of 30 years old. This was the 70th week of the time prophecy. It was AD 27, matches up perfectly with Daniel. So he ministered three and a half years. Then as Daniel said, he was cut off violently. He was crucified for our sins and then how does he confirm the covenant for a full week? Because Hebrews 2, 3 tells us that the apostles continued for another three and a half years confirming the covenant to the Jewish nation until the time of AD 34 when Stephen was stoned and then the gospel went to the Gentiles. So Matthew 1, 21 says, she will bring forth a son. You shall call his name Jesus. Yeah. He will save his people from their sins. Abraham saw Christ's day. He rejoiced. He understood, I believe, about the death and the resurrection of Christ. And that's why Abraham believed that if he sacrificed Isaac, God, would resurrect him. Amen. Thank you so much, Shelly. Uh, don't go anywhere. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Welcome back to our lesson number three, God's Call to Mission. We're going to turn it over to Pastor John Lomacain in Tuesday's lesson. Yes, this is entitled Abraham's Call. Now, this is my wife and I's story. We have read through this story several times and it is amazing how it parallels so much of how our ministry began. I'm going to just go ahead and start with uh, Genesis 12 verses 1 to 3. We, we talked about that in a previous lesson, then we're going to segue to the guts of this lesson. But let's look at this. You know, back in 1987 when we received a call to the Northern California Conference to begin ministry and evangelism and then and pastoring, this was so much of our life. Let me just read it to you and break it down as we go on. Now the Lord said to Abraham, or Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. 
and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. When we accepted the call in 1987, honestly, we were on our way to Vallejo, California. We had no clue where we were going to live. We began with $1,000, but we had to buy a hitch because it almost tore our bumper off trying to pull a U-Haul. Mm. We entered California with under $500 left. Now, anybody who lived in California, maybe you live in California, our intention was to have enough money for first and last month's rent plus security deposit to find a place to live. Is that ludicrous or what? <laughs> <laughs> so we had no idea. We stayed in a, 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 a truck stop motel where you don't take your shoes off in the, cause the mm -hmm. carpets, mm -hmm. truckers grease all over the place and just kind of, that's all we could afford. Day in and day out, day in and day out, two days in a row, we were spending money trying to get a place to live and we kept getting turned down because we didn't have enough credit established because of traveling two years with the Heritage Singers. And finally, in frustration, we threw the newspaper down and the Lord showed us uh, where he wanted us to live. And we ended up going up to a brand new apartment complex in the city of Vallejo, California. And um, it's at $75 deposit. And to make the long story short, uh, we were able to get in for only $238. Aww. Did not require a deposit, did not require first and last month's rent. It was prorated didn't have to pay to turn the lights on, didn't wow. have to pay to turn the phone on, didn't have to pay to turn the heat on. And last year, my wife and I went back to that. I wish I could have shown the picture in the Sabbath school lesson and took a picture in front of that apartment and the number was apartment number seven, mm -hmm. God's fingerprint. Mm. Amen. And literally, we left on the way to California. My wife, we pulled over and she bawled. She said, I'm leaving my whole family. I don't even know where I'm going. And I remember we were in a restaurant in Texas where she started crying at the table. Where are we going? We don't even have enough money. Why are we doing this? Mm. And I say this with great humility. When we look back today and people say, you know, you've blessed me. You guys are a blessing to me. You know, I'm blessed by your music, by your ministry. I say that with all humility, I had no clue what God's plan was. Mm -hmm. So when I read about Abraham, there's somebody watching this today might be saying, I don't know what God's plan for my life is. It's so scary. Now we look back, honestly, my, my brothers and sisters in Christ, we look back and we honestly ask the question, would we do that today? Mm -hmm. And we said we were either crazy <laughs> or we were filled with faith. Mm -hmm. And I believe it was the second we were filled yeah. with faith because we prayed for seven days in a row for God to open the doors in ministry. And when the call came from Northern California, from a president we did not know, from a conference we never sent a letter to, from people that we did not ask, we knew that God had answered the prayer. And here we are in our 37th year of ministry, 40 years of marriage, and we look back on the story of Abraham and I say, this was crazy, but then we say, wait a minute, we were just as crazy as he was, or we were just as much at the place where we trusted God enough to believe him. So what, I'm, what am I saying to you? You don't have to put all the pieces together to, to, to trust God and follow him because God already has the pieces together. Yes. He says, I know the plan I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you a future and to hope. Through all the years of ministry, we've learned a lot of things. We've done some things right. We've done some things wrong. We've done some things we'd never do again. We've done some things we wish we did differently. That was the life of Abraham. When you go to Genesis chapter 12, you find in this whole chapter, God is bringing out the faith of Abraham and the frailty of Abraham. You know, when he had an encounter and um, he ran into Pharaoh and Pharaoh said, what a lovely, what a lovely woman. And let's look at the, pick up the story right there in Genesis 12. Because the question was, what things happened to Abraham and what mistake did this man of God make? Mm -hmm. I want to Men of God do make mistakes. Women of God make mistakes. People of God make mistakes. I love the reason this story is recorded because it shows that in his frailty, God is still perfect. Mm. It says in, Gen in Genesis 12, verse 10, Now there was a famine in the land, and Abraham went down to Egypt to dwell there, for the famine was severe in the land. And it came to pass when he was close to entering Egypt that he said to Sarai, his wife, Indeed, I know that you are a woman of beautiful countenance. 
I said to my wife all the time, I have a picture on my phone, love that lady. Therefore, it will happen. And he planned this. When the Egyptians see you, that they will say, this is his wife. And they will kill me, but they will let you live. Please say you are my sister, that it may be well with me for your sake, and that I may live because of you. So it was when Abraham came into Egypt that the Egyptians saw the woman, that she was very beautiful. The princes of Pharaoh also saw her and commanded her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. He treated Abraham well for Abram well for her sake. He had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male and female servants, female donkeys and camels. But the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this that you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister? I might have taken her as my wife. Now, therefore, here is your wife. Take her and go your way. So Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. Then Abram went up to Egypt. And this is chapter 13, verse 1. Then Abram went up to, from Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and lot with him to the south. This is an amazing story. And I always ask, why did the Bible record this? Hmm. This is crazy. Pharaoh was open to God's prompting mm. Mm -hmm. and Abraham, who was God's servant, wasn't. Yeah. Mm. This is an amazing story. A man who would literally have said, I don't care if you're Abraham's wife. I want her. I'm going to kill this guy. I'm going to take her anyway. His heart was so moved by God, impressing on him. And the Bible says God plagued him. Mm. In other words, God said, you better not. And he responded. Mm. And Abraham premeditated this lie. Mm -hmm. And yet, through all of this, God's promise to make him a great nation was still fulfilled. Mm. What am I saying, friends? Why does God allow obstacles to come in your way? And I want to just make this very practical, practical for you today. Obstacles will arise when you trust in your plans and not God's plans. Mm. They'll, be, uh, they'll appear to be greater obstacles than you can ever surmount. And you might even surmise in your mind that I need to help God out on this case. And you know in the story of Abraham, he did that quite a bit. But why does God allow obstacles to come? Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6. I think we all know it. Mm -hmm. And this is something that Abram had to learn. And believe me, in my own ministry, I had to learn this too. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Can we say it together? And lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. Now, you go through all of this and then you go down to the book of Hebrews and you read this little statement about a man whose life was so frail, mm. about a man whose ministry was so discombobulated, about a guy who listened to his wife when she started making suggestions outside of God's plan. What a couple! And then the Bible says in this, of this couple, Abraham, um, Hebrews 11, verse 8. It should have been Abraham 11, verse 8. <laughs> By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. Why did he go out? Because he trusted God and he had to learn throughout his life to keep trusting God. So I want to make this very practical. I see where God has led my wife and me and God wants to lead you the same way. God has led all of us. We all have stories about God's leading. Does God pick perfect people? Can we all say the answer? Ah, no. <laughs> no. But is God's plan perfect? Amen. Yes. Amen. So as you're growing as a Christian, don't focus on your frailty. Focus on trusting God with all of your heart. And the plan that God has for your life will be fulfilled mm -hmm. to his glory and honor. And when, when people look back, they might say they obeyed God. May you make that decision today. Amen. 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 Thank you, John. That, uh, Hebrews chapter 11, that's what... Uh, God's people look like in the investigative judgment. You know, we talked about that earlier in oh, Daniel yeah. chapter 7. All the faults are gone. All the mistakes are gone. It's just the positive. My name is Pastor James Rafferty. I'm Pastor James Rafferty, and we are in Wednesday's lesson, The Early Church and Comfort Zones. And we pick up in Acts chapter 8, 1 through 4. What does God do when the church gets too comfortable and they won't engage with Him in missionary work, right? Mm. In mission out. What, is, what does God do when the church gets too comfortable? Here we go. Acts chapter 8, 1 through 4. This may surprise you. 
And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which is at Jerusalem. Now, let's just stop there for just a second. The church at Jerusalem is filled with the Spirit of God. Mm -hmm. The church with Jerusalem, they are just witnessing for Jesus, et cetera, et cetera. But there's a comfortability that's, that's creeping in. And sometimes we don't even know that. Sometimes we can be so Laodicean that we're not even aware of this neglect yeah. of doing God's work. And so what does God do? Notice what it says here. A great persecution against the church arose in Jerusalem and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him for Saul. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house, hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Therefore, they were scattered abroad. See, it says it again. They were scattered abroad and went everywhere preaching the word. Now, we've emphasized several times in our Sabbath school lessons here that God is ultimately in control of all things. Romans 8, 28 says, all things work together for good. Not everything that happens is God's will, but God overrules even the bad things that happen for good. But when we look at these verses and this emphasis on being scattered abroad, guess what? God is going to work through this. That's right. God is going to work out this out for good. Why? Because as the quarterly says, until this time, the early church was mainly in Jerusalem or within the Jewish territory among the Jewish people. When persecution began in which Saul, a devout Jew and a Pharisee was actively involved, the church in Jerusalem was then dispersed over all Judea. Does that sound familiar? Mm -hmm. And Samaria and of course, to the uttermost parts of the world. Oh, mm -hmm. We see a little bit of God's will here coming in, right? Jesus had predicted in Acts 1.18 that you will be my witness in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria. That statement was fulfilled as noted in Acts 8.4. Those that had been scattered preached the word everywhere they went. Mm -hmm. So you see how God is working here. I think it's interesting that God used Saul to scatter the church abroad so that they would reach out to the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. And this outreach was the very thing God's people consistently failed to do in the Old Testament, mm. right? Go back to the Old Testament. For example, Israel under Jeho Jehoiakim failed to witness of their covenant faithful mm. God, primarily by failing to let God be covenant faithful in their lives. So God uses an enemy of his church Nebuchadnezzar to scatter his church among the nations for the purpose of witnessing and discipleship making. Mm -hmm. In the New Testament, Saul, the very one who was central to scattering God's New Testament people, becomes the center of witnessing to the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. And in the Old Testament story of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar, the very one who was responsible for scattering the Old Testament church, mm -hmm. also became the center of witness to the Gentile world. That's right. Think about this. That's good. In Daniel chapter 2, Daniel, of course, is interpreting a dream. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, right? John, you were just talking about how God could speak, speak through Pharaoh, even though there's Moses, his faithful. God is speaking through. God speaks to Nebuchadnezzar. That's right. People ask us sometimes, why did God give a dream to a heathen king, right? Mm -hmm. Because God is in the business of discipleship making. And right. God knows that Nebuchadnezzar is going to be a powerful disciple for Jesus, for God, for the truth. And so God gives this dream and God makes sure that Nebuchadnezzar cannot remember the details. But it, he does remember it troubled him enough to where he is so anxious about this dream that he decides to fire and annihilate his entire cabinet. All his wise men, they're all going. And Daniel's included with that. And so Daniel, again, we talked about this earlier, Daniel, missionary minded, discipleship minded, he says, what can I do to help the king? Mm. He's thinking of, his, of, of the king, not of himself. What can I do to help the king? He prays for the king. He intercedes for the king. God gives him an answer. He brings the answer to King Nebuchadnezzar and he gives the interpretation. At the end of all of this, verse 46 of Daniel chapter 2, then Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face. He worshiped Daniel. He commanded that they should offer an oblation, sweet ozer unto him. And the king answered, verse 47, unto Daniel and said, of a truth it is that your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings, a revealer of secrets, seeing thou couldst reveal this thing. 
Now we have missionary work taking place. Now we have discipleship taking place. And discipleship includes teaching, right? Discipleship includes educating and instruction. And that's what Daniel has just done. And the reason Daniel could do this was because he was faithful to principle. He was true to the principles of the health message that God had given him, even though there were many others of his sort that weren't. Because you remember, Melzar was like, well, what's going to happen when your face is worse looking than everyone else of your sort? Mm -hmm. Daniel says, ah, no problem there. We follow the health message. God will bless us, right? Nebuchadnezzar becomes the center. And then you go on to Nebuchadnezzar's own testimony in Daniel chapter 4. Notice verses 1 through 3. Here's what, what happens here. Nebuchadnezzar the king unto all the people and nations and languages. Where do we get that verse in the New Testament? Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. Sound familiar? Right. So Nebuchadnezzar the king to all the nations, peoples, and languages. Are, are angels, are the angels revealed in Revelation 14 going to include people that may not be Seventh-day Adventists? Mm -hmm. Could there be people now in Babylon that will be proclaiming a message to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people called the everlasting gospel? You think? Nebuchadnezzar says, Peace be multiplied unto you. I thought it good to show you the signs and the wonders that the high God has wrought to me. How great are his signs, how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. His dominion is from generation to generation. Nebuchadnezzar is sharing this with the whole world. Mm -hmm. Nebuchadnezzar is doing what Israel failed to do, what Judah failed to do, what God's people failed to do. Nebuchadnezzar is doing this. And God saw this. God foresaw this because God knows all things. God foresaw that Nebuchadnezzar would be faithful if only Jehoiakim would go over there and witness to him. Jehoiakim fell flat on his face. He wasn't just a bad witness. He was a terrible witness. He made an oath that he'd be loyal to Nebuchadnezzar and he broke that oath. And Nebuchadnezzar by this time had already encountered Daniel and Daniel's God. And Nebuchadnezzar's like, what kind of Adventist is, what kind of Israelite is this, right? That's what's happening right now. In our church, we have the wheat and the tares, the good and the bad, but God is going to allow persecution to purify the church. Listen to this statement. It's found in, uh, in, in the context of this. I mean, the question I'm going to ask you is, who, those who may seem like our greatest persecutors will in the last days, like Nebuchadnezzar, take their stand, like Saul, take their stand for the truth. Quote, Great Controversy, and we're looking at page 607. As the controversy extends into new fields, the minds of the people are called to God's downtrodden law. Satan is astir. The power attending the message will only madden those who oppose it. The clergy will put forth almost superhuman efforts to shut away the light lest it shine upon their flocks. By every means at their command, they will endeavor to suppress discussion of these vital questions. The church appeals to the strong arm of the civil power, and in this work, papists and Protestants unite. As the movement for Sunday enforcement becomes more bold and decided, the law will be invoked against commandment keepers. They'll be threatened with fines, imprisonment, and some will be offered positions of influence and other rewards and advantages as inducements to renounce their faith. Are we going to be able to withstand in this time? Are we going to be able to stand faithful in this time? But their steadfast answer is, <laughs> show us from the Word of God our error. I love mm. that. I love it. That's what Luther said. If I can be convinced from the Word of God, show us from the Word of God our error. It goes on. The statement goes on here. The same plea that was made by Luther under similar circumstances. Those who are arraigned before courts make a strong vindication of the truth. Mm -hmm. What are they doing? They're making disciples. <laughs> Sometimes we think discipleship making is, is what takes place in a very calm, peaceful environment. People are open to the truth, whatever. No, discipleship making sometimes takes place under great duress and persecution. We call it mm -hmm. captive evangelism. Daniel was a captive evangelist. He was an evangelist in captivity. They make a strong vindication of the truth and some who hear them are led to take their stand mm. to keep all the commandments of God. Thus, light will be brought before thousands who otherwise would know nothing of these truths. Mm -hmm. God is going to work through persecution and he confirms this. You know, after the church was persecuted in Acts chapter 8, Peter saw a vision in Acts chapter 10. And the vision Peter saw was basically, you need to go to the Gentiles. I just want to confirm that. He saw a vision of, you know, of the food, different kinds of food. And we see the same thing in the Old Testament. You know, Daniel was taken captive and Jeremiah, the prophet of God, was told, this is God's will. You need to go into captivity and you need to submit to the Babylonians because you're to, you, you're to be a witness among them. This is what you failed to do so far and God wants you to do this. So both in the New Testament and the Old Testament, persecution is confirmed as a way to get the truth before thousands who would never hear it otherwise and to boldly take a stand for the truth so that many other people seeing that witness 
will be saved in God's kingdom for all eternity. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Pastor James. Beautiful message. I'm Ryan Day. I have Thursday's lesson entitled, Starting from Where You Are. It's important that we recognize that God is calling us to co-labor with Him in uh, basically partaking of the mission of sharing the good news, sharing the gospel. Uh, and many people ask the question, but I don't know where to start. Do I, do I get on a plane and I go and start a new life overseas somewhere? Do I, what, am I, what am I called to do? Sometimes we have to just start exactly where we are, wherever we are at that moment. Uh, the Bible, or the, actually the lesson takes us to the Bible and it has us going to our, our text of the, of the lesson today, which is found in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. We're going to read that again and then we're going to dive deep into this. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 again says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And so there are a couple of aspects uh, that this particular verse brings out here, and we're going to get into that. Uh, but I love how the lesson brings out that while, yes, we definitely need to determine where it is that God wants us to be sharing in this mission, uh, where we are to begin, where our starting point is. Uh, I just want to read a portion of what the lesson says here in the aftermath of this verse. It says, this is the principle set out by Jesus that shows us how we need to act as his disciples who have the good news to share with others. So that principle obviously is the fact that we shall receive power mm -hmm. when the Holy Spirit is coming upon us and it will lead us to witness to others, obviously on a local level, Jerusalem, and then the other parts of the, of the world, which we see there as Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Uh, but notice next what, the, what this particular uh, text says here, and I just love it. It says, sharing the truth, and this is, if you didn't get anything else out of today, get this, it's important. Sharing the truth is not about convincing others how wrong they are, mm. Amen. but about sharing Jesus as portrayed in the three angels messages of Revelation 14 verses 6 through 12. My goodness, mm -hmm. I could spend a whole segment just on that. Um, I remember years ago when I started witnessing, that, that was my methodology. I, did, I was young, I was ignorant, I didn't really know exactly how to witness. I wasn't taught how to witness uh, until I went on to the Amazing Facts Center of Evangelism where I was formally trained how to be the best witness for Christ. But before that, man, my, I thought my, my job was to go out and tell, again, at misquoting and misapplying Isaiah 58, 1, you know, cry aloud, Spare not, share, show my people their sins. And that, I took that personal. I was like, yes, I got to go out and tell everyone of how wrong they are about this and this and this and this and what the Bible says. And it's a horrible witnessing method. And I just wanted to share that because it was in the lesson here. And, and the lesson goes on to say, there are, however, some principles in the words of Jesus in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And first, of course, it highlights that when we understand what witnessing is about and what we are witnessing about, we're witnessing about Jesus. We're sharing Jesus, his character, his love, the good news about what he has done for us. Then we need to understand where it is that we need to begin. And of course, uh, the lesson brings out first uh, and it highlights Acts 1 and 8 where it says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. And it says, as we have seen, but it is worth repeating, we are to be his witnesses in the place where we are, where we physically reside. Uh, where are you? Where do you live? Uh, then it goes on to say, this may include our home our church, our neighborhood, and our community. Are you witnessing well in your home? Are you being the best witness that you can to your family? Are you being the best witness you can even in your church? Sometimes we, we forget and we think witnessing needs to be outside the church. We need to go into the streets and the byways and highways and, and we certainly do, but many times we forget about how much those inside our sphere of influence within the actual church need to see and hear the good news of Jesus Christ themselves. Uh, it goes on to say we need to be uh, his witnesses first where we are in the house, or excuse me, in the area he has initially placed us. That would be home or work or to be his witnesses to the people closest to us. It can be close family or extended family, church people, work colleagues, neighbors, and in the community. All of these are within your area where God has placed you. Uh, but it's important, again, emphasizing the Holy Spirit aspect of that. 
We cannot begin to be an effective witness if we do not have the power of God behind us. I think Pastor said on a previous, Pastor Luma King, you said on a previous lesson, uh, something about the, uh, being, being fueled with the right, you know, you're useless if you don't have the right fuel or the right power behind you. And I just made a note here, you can't be the witness you need to be to others around you until you yourself are tuned in with the power of God that is the Holy Spirit. You need to test yourselves, as the Bible says, test yourselves whether or not uh, you are of the Spirit of God, whether or not you are in the faith, as Paul writes. We need to make sure that we are being the best witnesses that we can, led indeed by the true Spirit of God. I'll never forget years ago, I had this guy in church, uh, and, uh, and it just popped into my head just now, uh, as I, was, I wrote it down as we were preparing to, to do this lesson. And this guy uh, came to me, this was early on in, in my church experience. He came to me every week, every week. And he would give me these DVDs. It was health DVDs. Mm. And he would share health DVDs with me, health, health messages and stuff. And I was like, okay, you know, I'm coming out of, you know, my previous background, having eaten everything and everything that had a heart beat and a mama and walked. I ate it because I came from Babylon. And, and so this guy knew that. He knew I was fresh in the faith and new in the faith. And he came and he was sharing all this stuff with me. And I was like, all right, you know, it was new to me. And I'm mm. like, all right, I go home and watch this and read this. And, and he, every week, every week, every week, health, 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 health. And I was like, all right, all right, you know, I'm, I'm taking it from him. And then I went over to visit his house one day because he invited me over to do some Bible discussion. And when I pulled up in the lawn, he was, it was out on the front porch and he was, uh, oh no, <laughs> smoking. Oh no. That just kind of, it did something there. It, you know, it didn't make the information any less true, but it destroyed his witness to yeah. me. Make sure that we're living by the power of God that's leading us to be appropriate witness where we're living up to what it is that we believe. Uh, another, another, I have a family member who is a minister, a pastor, uh, but yet he grew up in his, he, he raised all of his children, beating them. I mean, abusing them, abusing his wife, uh, just a mess would go over to, pe you know, teach in his own church that the TV is the one-eyed devil and it's horrible, but yet would go over to people houses and he would watch TV and grab the remote and, you know, and, and, and all of his children still to this day are not in the church at all. They despise religion. What kind of witness are you being in your home, in your church, in your community, within your sphere of influence? Are you empowered by the Spirit of God or do you need that transformation yourself before you can be that true witness for the Lord? Some of us have allowed the light to grow dim and we need to say, Lord, I need a transformation. I need you to light up my life with the Spirit of God so that I can be that vessel of honor that you're proud of. Some of us have fallen away all the while thinking we're still tuned in with God when really we're not. Uh, you know, again, doing all of these wonderful things for him, you know, casting out demons and all the wonderful works, but yet we do not know him. It's important that we make sure we know. You know this was Lot's problem. I'm not going to have time to read all of this, but it's interesting. If you go read Genesis 19, this was Lot's problem. Lot had come from a family. He was, he thought that since he was from the chosen family of Abraham, a, a descendant from Abraham, that he was safe and he was saved and his family was saved and that there was nothing that could be done. But yet when he moved away from, you know, God's will and he moved over into Sodom and Gomorrah, you read Genesis 19 there, you know, it even says that he, he got to a point where he became so desensitized with sin that he was willing to give up his daughters yeah. to, to men for them to do what they wanted to with him. And then when the angels told him, is there anyone else in this city that you need to tell to get out of here? He goes to his sons-in-law and it's interesting. It says in verse 14 of Genesis 19, it says, so, so Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law who had married his daughters and said, get up, get out of this place for the Lord will destroy the city. But his sons-in-law seemed, uh, his sons-in-law, uh, he seemed, thought that he had been joking. Mm. They, he seemed to them to be joking. What does that say about Lot's witness in his own home and in his own uh, sphere of influence? He was not the man of God that he was supposed to be. He drifted away from the Lord. He was not being led by the appropriate spirit. In fact, if you were going to read the story, those angels had to drag Lot and his family out of Sodom and Gomorrah. Mm. Don't be that. Don't be that family. Make sure that as leaders in your home, leaders in your community, leaders in your church, or, or, or just the laity in general, that we are being the best witness that we can be first in Jerusalem and then as the lesson goes on to bring about uh, to Judea, Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The lesson says again, Jesus affirms the reality that witnessing involves 
crossing cultural boundaries sometimes. Beginning from where we are, we may be called to move to other areas to reach out to different social, ethnic, and religious groups. If I belong to a certain ethnic or language people group, it may be much easier for me to witness to them because of minimal cultural barriers to, barriers to cross. In some areas of the world, only one clan or tribe is represented in the makeup of the church. However, Jesus' great commission tells us that as His witnesses moving out of our comfort zone and investing our resources for such people groups is crucial. They also need the message of Jesus. And of course it ends, the lesson ends with 13 with challenging us to identify and make a list of people and groups with special needs in our communities whom the church has not necessarily potentially at this point made efforts to reach. Whoever that is, my friends, pray that the Lord will place it upon your heart to first change you, to make you that appropriate witness. And then also as the challenge is extended here to uh, ask the Holy Spirit to lead you to witness to those people who need to be reached with the gospel. Amen. Thank you so much. What an incredible lesson. I want to give each one of you a moment to share something about your day. Start with Shelley. Just a thought occurred to me. What did Abraham do that was so special that God made him the father of all and said mm -hmm. everyone will be blessed through him? First, he believed God. God credited it to him as righteousness. But God actually says in Genesis 18, the reason he chose Abraham, he knew Abraham would teach his children and his descendants to obey God, to walk in his righteous ways. All you have to do to be a blessing in this earth is to share God and how important it is to obey him. That's right. We also find despite Abraham's errors, choices, and, and lack of faith at times, we find in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, and this is true about us, the Lord not only forgives, but here's what he says. My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon us. It's not our perfection, but it's his perfection that brings us to the place where we can be fully obedient and grow in Christ. Amen. You know, sometimes God moves us out of our comfort zones through uh, persecution. And we shouldn't be afraid of persecution. You know, sometimes people are a little afraid to even become Christians because of persecution. Mm -hmm. But persecution could be the very means through which God is going to make us a witness for Him and cause us to be able to make disciples for Him. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Jesus said at one point of the Gospels, remember Lot's wife. Don't be like Lot and his family. Make sure that you put Christ at the center of your home and your heart and be a great witness for Him in bringing others to Jesus Christ. Thank you so much, Ryan, Pastor James, Pastor John, and Shelley. What an incredible study. God's call to mission. We thank you for joining us as well. I think in my own heart and life, this is a sobering call. It's practical, but God is calling us to put him first, to put aside all those other things and let him change and transform us so we can be his missionaries. Join us next week, lesson four, sharing God's mission.